stretch out your faith. Spiritual awareness in God. Now this chapter is dealing with uh, somebody who we always hear the story about, my man Abraham, a man of great faith, a man who believed God in spite of everything. God spoke to him and told him that I'm going to do this and it's going to come to pass. When I said it's going to come to pass, and years later, we see God fulfilling a promise that he said that he was going to do. And God told him, so I want you to go out from the land where your father is. Because they was worshiping false gods and all this other type of stuff. And what I want you to do is I want you to just go out. I don't want you to wonder and question where I want you to go. I just want you to go. And I'm going to tell you when to stop. I just want you to go. I'm stretching out your faith. And in this chapter, we see not only did God bless him, but God showed himself faithful. And we see here in this uh, next chapter how God begins to really stretch his faith where God um, asked him to sacrifice his only son. Now, this was a very profound chapter. Um, so we're going to go ahead and jump right on into it. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt or tested Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. Now, one of the key things into stretching out your faith is hearing when God is calling you, when God is trying to get your attention. Just as God called Abraham out and told him to go where he was at to a place where God would show him, so too God calls us out from what we are used to, to what's called a journey of faith. A journey of faith. Now, what is faith? It is complete confidence or trust in a person. It is a strong unshakable belief in something. In every step of our journey, God builds us up in, in our unshakable faith to believe him in spite of everything. No matter, okay, she kind of went up for a minute, sorry. sorry. I got <laughs> lost him for a minute. He builds our faith up no matter how circumstances look, he always is looking for an opportunity to build us up. I put there an example of, there's a story on YouTube, it's one that I was going through um, a few years ago, and I was in UC Library, and you can't be going through and see testimonies like this. This is the type of stuff that is supposed to be quiet in the library, but you see something like this, you mess around and get put out the library. But there was a story on there, it's called A Bulletproof God. Could you uh, scroll back up please? Okay, right there. It's called a bulletproof God. And it was these uh, people that was on her, and they was giving this, uh, this testimony or story about how um, they had just, I believe, come from a church event. And, you know, they was all wrapped up and everything. And they um, happened to stop at a store, and they was getting ready to, you know, get out the car. And somebody else was, um, was going in or coming out. It was, it was vice versa, one of the two. They was going in, and they was coming out. But uh, the, the fact of the matter was is that the person kind of looked at them funny, like giving them that type of look like, you know, like, they, they wanted to start something with them. Now, they didn't know the person. They just kind of looked at them and, you know, kept it moving. But the person was eyeballing them. And, you know, here in um, Cincinnati, I know one thing I've noticed that people sometimes mistake you for somebody else. Because I already got mistaken for somebody a few times. Like, look, I'm not that person. I'm sorry. Keep it moving. And, you know what I'm saying? I don't even worry about it. But they thought they were somebody else. And the person, they just shrugged it off because they just came from church. They was feeling good. Got in their car. Drove out. Going wherever they were going because they were feeling good. And this person that was eyeballing them came back out, jumped in the car, and they started following them. So they're going up the road, you know, they, they ain't thinking nothing about it. And all of a sudden, they see this car that's just following them. It's, it's a little ways back, and it's following them, it's following them. And they don't know why they're following them. So they speed up a little bit, you know, they get off somewhere else, they turn, here comes that car, it's still following them. So they speed up a little bit more, and they make a couple of turns, and all of a sudden, you know, they're getting ready to get on the expressway. They don't see the car, so they're like, okay, well, who God, you know, I don't know who that was. I don't know why they was following us, but... They driving down the road, you know, 50, 60, whatever. All of a sudden, they see this car coming out of nowhere, speeding. Had to be going like 100 miles an hour, just gaining on them out of nowhere. And all of a sudden, they just start pleading the blood of Jesus. They just start calling on the Lord because they don't know why this car is coming after them. And the person who was in the driver's seat, the Lord told them to slam on the brakes because the person was in right behind them, but they was coming on the side of them. So the Holy Ghost told them, slam on the brakes. So they slammed on the brakes. So they, they're coming back as the other car is coming forward. And somebody reaches out in the car with a shotgun. And they begin, they, they point right at the car, and they shoot the bullets right into the car. It shatters the windshield. They in there praying. You talk about having faith. You got to believe God right there. It ain't no time to be wondering. Either you going to believe God or you not going to believe God. It's a matter of faith right there. So the bullets came in, and it shattered the window, and it went back, and it hit one of the guys in the chest, and he said, I'm hit. I'm hit. And everybody's in there, and they're praying. They're praying. They're like, oh, my God, oh, my God, where are you 
hit? Where you hit? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, can't, I can't find a bus. I can't find a bus. Where are you hit? Where are you hit? I, I can't find it. When he looks on the floor of the, of the car and he sees the bullets on the floor of the car. And he's like, what, what? And he had his Bible right here. And he looks like, well, why are the bullets on the floor? Floor and he looks at his Bible and there was a dent in his Bible and he realized that the bullets came in and they came in to kill him but they hit the word and they bounced off and they ended on the floor seat of that car and they began to give a testimony that the, they should have died but the bullets bounced off the Bible and his life was spared that day and they said God when I see, God said when I see the blood I will pass over you and they started giving a, a praise you talk about church man i was sitting there like man i can't keep it together i gotta get out this library right now because i was going through at that moment but to hear that testimony about being a bulletproof guy that even in the midst of a situation of people they didn't probably didn't even know these guys they just happened because they didn't they looked at them wrong or something they came after them with a shotgun and they, they shot at them but they had faith they stretched out their faith and they believed God right at that moment. And God showed forth his favor in their life. The blood passed over them and the church went crazy. Y'all got to check the testimony out on YouTube, a bulletproof God. And it shows that when we stretch out our faith, God will show himself strong in our lives. And verse number two, and it says, and he said, take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. And get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. God was saying, I want you to give me what's near and dear to your heart. I don't want you to give me the second best. I don't want you to give me third best. I don't want you to give me something that you just scrunched up. I want you to give me something that's near and dear to your heart. Abraham had waited on the promise of God Said he was 100 years old, and now the very thing that he was waiting for, now God was asking for that same thing right back. When God asks us to sacrifice something, there was always a reason behind it. God always has something. He's always looking at the big picture. We, even when we ask God, like, God, I don't understand why you're asking me to do this. God, God is always, we're always looking at the right now, but God always sees the big picture of why he's asking us to do something. Even though we may not understand it, it is not for us to try to reason in our own understanding, but to trust that God asked us to sacrifice because there is a greater good that we can't see right now, but it's going to affect something way down the road that we don't even know nothing about. But God has already gone before us and set the path, so he already sees what's down the road. As we grow as Christians, God is always looking to build us and make us stronger in him. Abraham had stepped out on faith and had such a spiritual awareness of God and the great things that God had been doing that he understood that God was stretching out his faith more and more. When God begins to ask him to get rid of this and get rid of that, I want you to do this, he didn't even question it. How many people or how many of us daily, when God asks us to give this up or give that up, do we question God? We say, God, man, I don't know if I can give that up. I want you to give me what's near and dear to your heart. I want that thing that you love. I want that thing that's number one in your heart. You don't think it's number one in your heart, but I look at your heart because God is the only one who searches the heart because the heart is desperately wicked and only God knows the heart. And he says, I want you to give me what's near and dear to your heart. And so many times it's like, God, I don't know if I can give you this. Even like the young man in the Bible, the rich man, he said, Lord, what must I do to uh, inter uh, have eternal life? And the Lord told him all these things like, yeah, yeah, I kept all that, Lord. He said, oh, you have? Okay. Go ahead and give up all your riches and uh, pick up your cross and follow me. He said, ah, yeah, Lord, I, I, can't, I can't really do it. He has so many riches and fame and all this stuff. He said, I, I can't give this up. And he walked away thinking he had everything together. But God saw his heart and he knew his heart really wasn't right. But if he would have trusted God and said, okay, God, I'll give this all. He may have never even known. God may have said, look, keep it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you double because you believe me when I ask you just to give it up. He don't even know. God could have gave him more. But sometimes because we try to reason in our own minds when God says, get us up, give that up. Well, we try to reason in our own minds and we miss out on our own blessing. But Abraham didn't do that. Now, note in the text that God asked Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Ishmael came as a result of Sarah and Abraham's disobedience. Ishmael came because of disobedience, but God still chose to bless Ishmael and his descendants, but stayed true to his word of the promise of a child which would come from Sarah. God stayed true. He was faithful. Can somebody read verse number three? And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and... Sorry. <laughs> 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 Is that a question of the word? 
Pittsburgh. <laughs> Obedience to God. God says rise up early, we get up late. God says I want you to pray at this time, we pray a little later. God says I want you to go witness to this person, he said we'll catch up to him later. God is always trying to bring us to an awareness in him, but we're not always attentive to what God is calling us to do. Even at times when he may wake us up at 4 o'clock in the morning, he said I want, I want you to get up and pray. Now, you don't even know God wants you to get a prayer. You think you're just getting up to go to the bathroom, your stomach grumbling, like, let me go to the fridge. I guess God will be able to get some weed. I'm going to fill my belly and go back to sleep, sleeping good. No, he didn't wake you up so you can go get something to eat. He didn't wake you up so you can go to the bathroom. He didn't wake you up so you can get you something to drink or call that person that's got a missed call on your phone. No, he didn't wake you up for that reason. He woke you up for a specific purpose. And the only way we're going to know why is if we seek him. I put another story up here. Um, I always got some stories. The Lord always said, man, I done been through some stuff where God said, okay, this is going to come out. This is going to bless the people. Um, I got this story <laughs> up here years ago. And um, this is and it's great because this has been years ago and none of y'all was here. Only person I think was here probably was Brittany. But, uh, but that's, that's it. Matter of fact, I, I don't even really know Brittany know about this story, but I haven't mentioned the person's name. But there was a story. Um, when I was in the Bible study, uh, I freshly got saved. And, you know, I was telling people, you know, um, you know, so you ever need anything, you ever need, you know, some prayer or something, just give me a call. You know, anytime. You got to be careful when we say anytime. Because people will <laughs> test you on that anytime. I get them calls at 2, 3 in the morning. Hey, uh, like, yeah, praise the Lord. Hey, uh, look, check this out. You know, I'm uh, asleep right now. Can you give me? And so I had to be careful with that anytime. But I got a phone call. It was like 3 o'clock in the morning. And I was asleep. You know, I was knocked out. I was sleeping good, too. And somebody had called me. And, you know, I saw the missed call, you know, I, I kind of went to reach for it, but I just didn't have the strength to get to it. I just, you know, just let it just go to missed call. And I just laid there, and the Lord spoke to me and told me, pick up the call, because that person is getting ready to call you back. Something just happened in their life, and I want you to pick that call. They're, going, they're getting ready to call you back, and I want you to pick that call up. And no sooner the Lord said that word, the person called me back. And I picked up the phone, and I was like, hello? And it, it, I could hear the urgency in their, in their voice. And it was like, I need you to come get me. I need you to come get me. I'm like, why? I just need you to come get me. They was crying and everything. I need you to come get me. And I'm like, why, why, why? And they said, um, on that very night, somebody had attempted to rape them. And I said, Jesus. I mean, so, you know, I immediately, I was half asleep. And I, I, I woke up, like, okay. You know, I so said, where are you? And I came to the person, and I came and I picked them up. And they was crying, and they was telling me the story. And they said, um... The person attempting to rape them wasn't even the bad, the worst of it. What was worse was the fact that the person was like a drug addict, and they told them what they was going to do to them before they raped them. They told them what they was going to do as far as with the needles and all this type of stuff. But by the mercy of God, they was able to get away without being harmed that night. And if it had not been for the Lord uh, getting my attention, if I wasn't aware at that time, who knows what could have happened to that person at that certain time. If I was not attentive to what God was saying, he was saying, I want you to get up because one of my own are hurting right now. And I need you to look past your sleep because your sleep is not more important than what I have for you to do. I don't check in with your schedule to see when you're free, when I need you to do something. I don't look on your schedule and say, well, I see you free at 4 o'clock. You know what I'm saying? I see you got class at 12. You're going to buy them shoes at 1.30. You're going to play basketball at 2. I'm not checking your schedule to see when you're available for me to use you. When I have something for you to do, it's for you to move with an urgency and not to question me, but just do it. And because of that, that person's life was spared. We sometimes become slack in doing what God calls us to do like waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning, because God may very well want us to pray for somebody. No matter how things look or what's happening in our life, we need to be obedient to God. And God says, do it. We just need to do it. And Abraham is showing us how to be obedient to God. Verse number 4 says, Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young man, Abide ye here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now, at this point, we don't see no signs of Abraham being worried about the sacrificing of his son. His son don't even know that the Lord says sacrifice his son. He ain't even worried. We don't see, we don't get, we don't get no commentary in the background. You know, somebody, you know, with a, in a mic like, yeah, Abraham looked like he's kind of scared right now. We don't, we don't get nothing about this man being concerned. The text doesn't tell us that he's even worried about it. He's just moving by faith at this point. Nor, 
does he is he hesitant in preparing a place for the burnt sacrifice? I had to forget where I was. Nor was he hesitant in preparing the place for the burnt sacrifice. Paul said, who has known the mind of the Lord that he would ask us to do certain things? Nobody knows the mind of the Lord but God. He, he's the only one that knows his own mind. Yet we see Abraham moving by faith and going to worship the Lord. His focus and his mindset is on doing what God has said to do, no matter how crazy it sounds. His focus is on doing what God said to do, no matter how crazy it sounds. Jesus, when he stepped on the earth, he would ask people to go do stuff that to others it may seem crazy, but people who were blind, he, was, he would spit us in some salve and he would wipe, wipe it together and he'd rub it on their eyes and say, go wash in the pool of Shalom. And because they just had the faith to believe it, they would just go and do what he said. They didn't have time to question, especially people who were blind and who were crippled. They didn't have time to question what he said. They just did it by faith. And then because they did it by faith, they were healed. They were delivered. They were set free. And sometimes people get caught up so many times on what God said rather than doing what God said. And I put up there a story about a man named Naaman. Naaman was one of the people in the Bible that got caught up on what God said rather than being obedient to what God said. He was a king, and one of the prophets, uh, Elisha, in uh, Kings, 2 Kings, had told him, um, to, he sent a messenger to go tell, him, uh, tell the king to go wash in the Jordan seven times. Now, this man is a king. He's offended, like, this man couldn't even come out to, to greet me. He's going to send somebody else to tell me, man, I ain't going to do that. He got caught up. In the, what, what the servant said, rather than being obedient, this man had like a leprosy or he had an illness and he needed healing. But because he got caught up in what he said, rather than being obedient to what the servant of God said, he was missing out on his own blessing. He hindered his own blessing because his attitude was wrong before God. He got caught up in the flesh rather than seeing his deliverance. And finally, after some days and thinking about it and saying, well, man, I can't believe he, he can't come out to meet me. I'm a king. I'm this, this, and that. As if you're great. As if you're somebody. But finally, he came to insist. He said, man, I'm just going to go to this Jordan River and wash seven times and see what happened. And he washed seven times, obedient to what the word that was given to him. And seven times, boom, he was healed and he was delivered from his illness. Because he, the man of God, spoke the word. And the man of God spoke it because God said, speak that to him. And because he was finally obedient to it, he got his deliverance. But he hindered his deliverance because he got caught up in what God said. Rather than being obedient to what God said. How many times on a daily basis do we get uh, caught up on what God said rather than being obedient to what God said? We get caught up so many times. And Abraham here, not even worried, not even concerned. We can take a good lesson from Abraham here. Your deliverance and the prayers that you've been praying for your brothers, your sisters, or whoever is within your reach. But you have to have faith to believe God even in the toughest moments of your life and stretch out your faith. We have the greatest power in the universe on the inside of us. And God can deliver anybody at any moment if we just believe him and are obedient to what he calls us to do. In verse number 6 it says, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Now again, Abraham not even concerned, not even worried about it, not even questioning anything. We would all be a little bit concerned if the Lord told us to sacrifice, like especially a little kid. You've been waiting all this time for this child to come, and now God wants you to sacrifice, and we'd all be a little concerned. But are you willing to stretch out your faith when God calls your faith to the carpet? Are you willing to stretch out your faith when God calls your faith to the carpet. There was a story, Kevin tells this story many times, and I saw this story, and it's, it was, it's very interesting, and it, at the same time, it's interesting, but it's sad. Um, he told a story about over in other countries um, where, you know, you can't just come freely and worship like we do. You can't just have a Bible study like this. You get killed over there in other countries for having a Bible study like this. But there was um, some uh, people who came in, I believe it was Muslims, they came in to this church and they came in with the machine guns, and they held up everybody, and they said, um, who's the pastor? And they called the pastor for him, and he said, I want everybody to come up here, and I want you to spit on the Bible and, and um, curse God. Otherwise, we're going to shoot and kill you. So the first person that came up and spat on the Bible was the pastor. The Bible says, you smite the shepherd, you scatter the sheep. So everybody else saw it, so they just all started following, shooting, spitting on the Bible, 
one by one, just following suit. And then there was a young girl who was 15 years old that came up, wiped it all off, and said, God, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they killed her right there on the spot. But she was willing to stretch out her faith and believe God. Her faith was called to the carpet, but she didn't let that hinder her because she knew in whom she had believed in. She knew in whom she had believed in, and she was fully persuaded. She wasn't halfway persuaded. The people that spit on the Bible weren't fully persuaded. Are you fully persuaded? Are you fully persuaded that whether I live or whether I die, I'm going to be with the Lord. If I die, I'm going to be with the Lord. If I live, it's still, it's going to be great gain whether I live or whether I die. You can't take away my salvation because you can't, you didn't give it to me. So you can't take it away from me. You can't take my joy away because you didn't give it to me. God gave it to me, so go ahead and kill me. All you're doing is just speeding up the process. He got a mansion up there waiting for me. He got some. He got a nice house up there. The grass is already cut. I ain't got to pay the rent. Everything is paid for. I ain't got food stamps to worry about. There's plenty of food up there. I ain't got student loans up there. I ain't got to pay a car note. I ain't got to worry about none of that. The mansion is up there. I got animals I ain't seen before that's up there. Everything is waiting for me. So you're going to go ahead and kill, kill me? I'm a holler. Matter of fact, go ahead. Hold on. Give me a second. Let me get a praise in before you kill me. I'm going to give God some glory right before you kill me because I'm, a, I'm not going to let the devil steal my joy and my happiness. You can kill me now, but all you're doing is just transporting me into my destiny and what God has for me. She, Her faith was caught to the carpet, and she gave God the glory, and everybody else just cursed it. Now, can you imagine a day of judgment standing before the Lord, and you spread on the Bible, well, God, you know, I really didn't mean it. I just, I did it, man. The gun was to my head, and I, you know, I, I, you know, I, you know, God just forgive me, you know what I'm saying? You know, but he's looking at the heart, and he said, no, nah, you wasn't really faithful. This young girl, 15, you the pastor, preaching to them. This young girl believed the words that came out of your mouth. And she had enough faith. She was fully persuaded in what you said. But you weren't even fully persuaded in what she was saying. But she was fully persuaded. And her reward is here. And now she's up here praising me. Abraham's faith was called to the carpet and he believed God. Verse number 6, it said, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac. And he took the... Did I read that already? Okay, verse 8. I'm about to say that. Where am I at? Okay. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Now wait a minute, Abraham. Now God just told you a few verses up that your son is going to be the sacrifice. Now you're saying God will provide a lamb for sacrifice. Wait a minute, are you lying to him? Wait a minute. Uh, 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 did you mishear what God said? God said your son is going to be the sacrifice. But no, Abraham was at a spiritual place in God that he understood what God was doing in his life. In each instance, God was trying to stretch out his faith, not only to bless him, but to prepare to bless those in and connected to him. But he had to trust God and obey. Some of us, again, can take some pointers from Abraham about just obeying God. God doesn't bring us so far just to ask us to do something crazy for no reason at all. God is not a crazy God. He does things for a specific purpose. Again, I put another story in there. I was talking about my, this person. I put in her an example my friend named Greg. I was just talking to him on the phone. Uh, a few years ago, he was living in a building where he hadn't had a job. He didn't have his license or nothing. He was living in that building for five years. And he just kind of was just kind of wasting away. He said, man, I wish God would just open up a door for, for me to get a car, get a job. And he was just in this building, and it was a bad environment that he was living in. And he had been praying and praying for God to make a way for him. And for some reason, some strife had been stirred up with him and the, the, the uh, landlord. All of a sudden, she didn't like him or something. So they was going at it. And then one day, the sheriff comes with the warrant and says, you got to get out today. Now, he's supposed to get 30 days at least to get out, but he was like, you got to get out today. Now, he wasn't expecting that he's going to be evicted today, so all his stuff gets put out front. And he's out there crying and going through everything like, man, I, don't, I can't believe all my stuff is out here. Everybody's saying I'm supposed to be a man of God and this and that. All these people seeing all my stuff out here. I go to church and everything. I'm telling people they need to come to church. They need to get saved. Now, look at me. Where's my faith at? And I'm sitting here crying. And in the midst, he gets some stuff together and he goes to stay with his sister. And over time, um, not only does he go to stay with his sister, but he goes back to his roots with church. And then uh, the people take him in at that church, and not only do they take him in, but then um, they open up a door for him to get a job. They, God blesses them with the favor to get him a job. So he gets the job, and not only does he get the job, now he wants to get his own place. So then God gives him the favor. Even though he was evicted, God gives him the favor for an apartment. And not only does he get an apartment, he gets an apartment right next door to his job. 
So now he doesn't have to worry about driving. He doesn't have to worry about anything. He gets a job right next door to his apartment. And he was telling me about it. And I can't believe God did. I said, now look what God did. Look what God did. He evicted you. You were looking at it as a bad thing, but God saw the big picture. God saw that what you was praying for. And sometimes when we pray for it, God got to take you through. Because if you got to see what God had to take you through to get to the blessing, we wouldn't want to go through it. Let God just show you the food. Let God show you that million dollars. Like, oh, Lord, I'm ready to get that million. But let him show you all the fires and all the heartache and all the, the suffering you got to go through. He ain't going to show you all that. He, all that is blank. All you see is the money right there. Now all you got to do is just get to it. Okay, I'm, I'm about to get to, you. Know, you you going to fall. You're going to stumble. You don't get to see all that. Because if you saw all of that, you wouldn't have enough faith to believe that you can get to it. But God shows that I want your faith to be in me and not in what you can see. And that's what I was telling my friend, that look what God did for you. He answered your prayer. You know, it didn't come the way you want. You just wanted him to just open up a door and leave you where you were. But God was not happy where you were. God was not happy. He was not content in a place because you were in a bad environment. He was trying to stretch your faith. And God was stretching Abraham here. He was stretching him. Verse number 9. We're coming down the stretch here. And it came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Now we see that Abraham still didn't budge in his faith towards God. He's being obedient, just binding his son. God will provide. God was stretching his faith, yet he still trusted in the Lord to provide. God wants to use us just like this to where we don't even question him. We just move by faith. Like a rubber band. You notice when you pull a rubber band, you pull it and you pull it and it stretches more and more. As you pull on it more, it stretches more and more and more. And to where it stretched so far, it's like, man. And then when you let it go, it goes so far. Based on how far you stretch it, it goes further and further and further. When we was in the world, the devil was stretching us, shooting us wherever he wanted to. We were going here, there, wherever. But now when God has got a hold to us, now he's stretching us to where wherever he shoots us to, it's a blessing to somebody else's life. It it brings deliverance to somebody else in the world. Again, I'll talk about that. Okay. On not only that, he stretches you. He stretches your faith towards specific situations so that he can get the glory, so that he can get the praise out of things in your life. T.D. Jakes once said that God created you for situations like this. You will flourish in hostile environments. I'll put you in adverse situations. I'll look for trouble and send you into it. Because trouble will ignite a passion and an anointing in you that you wouldn't have any other way. And you'll never find your greatness until I put you in a weak situation and force you to shine. I remember that. I remember I never forgot that because I was crying. I was in the car. I think I was going up to Toledo. I was crying, going in before the Lord. Oh, Jesus, let me keep myself together. A cop sitting right there. I'm like, the blood, Jesus. I'm, I think I was going 70. It was 65. Jesus, hallelujah, Lord. Let me get myself together. Let me focus right now. I don't want no ticket, Lord. Where's the angels at? Block it. God, block it. I want God to block that, that gun. Get the person on the side of me, God. He didn't pull me over. I said, thank you, Jesus. Went back into worship. But in that message, it encouraged me to let me know that God will put you in situations because he's trying to stretch you. He's trying to get something out of you. That message was called, Take It By The Throat. You'll never know how powerful you are until I throw you in the fiery furnace. And the thing that should have killed you only made you stronger. You'll never know how strong you are until I throw you into the fire. Just like the three Hebrew boys. Sometimes we always want to run away from the fire. God said, no, this time I'm going to corner you to where you got to get into the fire. But I'm trying to get something out of you. Even though the fire the fire looks hot, it doesn't matter how it looks. Where is your faith at? These the Hebrew boys, they just look. They told Nebuchadnezzar, look, whether our God deliver us or he don't deliver us, we still ain't going to worship you. This man turned the fire up seven times greater. Threw the men into the fire, and then he came and looked into the fire. So the man in there saw the three men in there giving God the glory, walking around in the fire. I bet they was giving God. I bet they had the. I bet they did the best shout that we ain't never seen before. I'm about to see that one when I get to heaven. I bet they was in there just walking around doing a two step in there, just getting they praise on in the midst of the fire. That then uh, Nebuchadnezzar didn't realize that fire is what purifies you. Fire purifies you. He turned it up seven times red. All you're doing is burning stuff off of me. That's all you're doing. That's why they put gold in the fire to burn off the impurities. So you just turn the fire up greater just to burn off some, some, some weight and some sin in my life. Thank you. I appreciate that. That was in their praising. And he looked in. He said, what, are three in there? I 
proxy for it. And other ones like the form of a uh, of the, the son of God. And as a matter of fact, get them up out of there. I'm tired of seeing them in a praise and uh, get them up out of there. And then he began to praise their God. God will stretch your faith, but we can't run away from the fire. We just have to stretch out our faith to believe God. God knows what God knows what he put in you. And he knows you won't let this situation or circumstances get the best of you without a fight. And since you know that he knows all things, he wants you to trust that he has already given you the victory before you ever saw your circumstances. He wants you to know that he's already given you the victory before you saw your circumstances. This is the day the Lord has made. Has made his past tense. That means he made it years ago. So you sitting here thinking about it. He made it before you even got here. So you already knew what you was going to go through. You already knew what you was going to be feeling. What you was going to have to deal with. So you might as well give him the praise because he already saw it. That means there was victory already on the other side. Because he had already made it. So that's why he wants us to praise him. So that you're able to trust him. That the stretching that he is doing in your life has a great and glorious end. A great expectation of victory. Verse number 10 through 12, it says, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon neither upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. <clears throat> now verse 11 and 12 when he had bound his son and was about to slay him, an angel called out to him and told him not to lay a hand, for I know that thou fearest God. And just as Abraham thought God had a ram in a bush to sacrifice, God took him through all of that, to not only to test his faith, but to see if he really feared God enough to do what God said by faith and not by sight. He took him through all of that just to see, will you believe what I said? Will you question me? I got some things, but I don't want you to question me. I just want you to do what I've asked you to do. I just want you to be obedient. God told Adam and Eve, don't eat of this tree. Why? It doesn't matter why I told you. I just told you to do it. I don't need you to question why I've asked you to do something in your life. Just do it. Abraham has stretched out his faith to the point where he did take a moment's notice to doubt God. When trials come our way, when they are walking through the schools, the malls, the bank shooting, killing everyone, and they come to you, Either you believe God to be your deliverer, your provider, or not. God done so much in our life, we should have notebooks full of testimonies of what God has done for us. Abraham had a knife in the hand, was about to slam, but because his ear was attentive to the voice of God, he stopped and didn't kill his son. Our trials and battles that we face are to build character and to teach us to be attentive, not only to what we have been through, but to what God has to say about our situation at a moment's notice. In afflictions that come our way in our life or our family, we sometimes lose focus on what God is trying to say to us. We let the test get the best of us. We don't, we don't think about what God is trying to say to us in the midst of struggle sometimes. Like, God, man, I can't believe I'm going through this, God, man. I'm struggling, man. I'm going to ask me about this, man. I ain't paid this bill, man. I'm about to get evicted, man. I don't know. And not, man, we're missing what God has said because God is always speaking. But we just ain't always listening. God has always got something to tell us, but we ain't always got our ears attentive to what he's trying to say. Verse 13. Can someone read verse number 13? And, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Now, Abraham had a complete, unshakable belief in his God. Now, God stretched his faith to the limit because what God had for him took faith and trust. God had already let him know that he was going to bring him to a place, a country. But God wasn't done there stretching his faith. The miracle that God did saving some of us that were definitely lost is only just the beginning of what he's able to do in our lives. In the times we are living in, there are so wicked. People are falling away from the faith and trust and complete assurance that God is a way maker. But I believe the things that the church is going through is only God trying to get us out of being comfortable, having comfortable faith, healing here and there. God is tired of people being comfortable. God doesn't want people that are comfortable. I have an example of my friend Sosina. She's from Ethiopia. Her church, uh, I remember some years ago when she first came here to America, their church is like 3 million people. Their choir is like 2,000 people. We get happy and one or two people get saved. They'll have a service and 5,000 people will get saved. Now you talk about a service, 
Somebody will walk in, 500 people will walk in with limbs literally carrying their arm and they'll walk out with both arms together. You talk about healing, she said people will walk in the door delivered, whatever they've been going through. Now you talk about a testimony, 100 people will get baptized in one day. 20, 30 kids filled with the Holy Ghost. Now you talk about revival, you talk about deliverance, you talk about prayer, and you talk about some praise. Now, all of us, you know, we, we have a, you know, we praise God for a certain amount of time, but their praise service, their praise service is from 8 to 12, and then they take a break. And then they come back and give God some more praise. We give a God about 20, 30 minutes of praise. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Ha! Jesus, hot. Jesus, I need to have a seat. Woo! Lord, I'll just get on with this message. I got some homework to do in a couple of hours. I got to go to this ball game. The movie, that movie's coming out. I've been waiting to see. I've been waiting for that movie to come out for a minute. I got to meet up with my boys. We getting ready to do this and that. No! They have worship service four and five hours. They are diligent in praising the Lord. They are diligent. Then the sermon comes hours later. That's a whole, that's a nine to five job. I'm like, the Lord would have to overshadow me if I went over there, because that's a lot of praise. I say, look, I'm about to step out at about 9.30. Um, I'll be back at 12.30, you know, when y'all start the next service, you know what I'm saying? I, get, I don't think I can praise it for that long. You know, I'm, 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 I lose the victory. I'm going to tell the truth and shame the devil. Um, but I let her know, like, look, I can't make it this long. That's a lot of praise and worship of God. But this teaches us that we need to have that type of a faith to believe God. Now, can you scroll up? There was a point that I wanted to make, but I forgot about it, and I need to make it. Scroll uh, right back up. Oh, uh, uh, no, go right back up. Okay, verse number 12. When, he, when God had told Abraham that, uh, seeing that thou has not withheld thy son, thy only son from me, you can scroll back down. The point that I wanted to make about this again, God runs it back again. Your only son. Your only son. Ishmael was not the one. Ishmael came because of disobedience. Ishmael represented the law. Ishmael represented man trying to get to God by man's own means rather than what God has established for man to get to God. Man, uh, Ishmael represents the flesh and how man is always trying to find means of doing things rather than by the means that God says do them. That's why God made clear to uh, Abraham that Isaac is your only son. He is your only son because Isaac represents freedom. He represents the bloodline that Jesus would come through. Ishmael represents the law. It represents bondage, despair. It represents death. It represents everything that's not like God. It represents enmity against God. That's why he said he is your only son. Isaac is your only son because he represents the promise and how Jesus would come through that lineage and he would set the people of God free. That's why he continues to reiterate. Anytime you see in the text when God repeats himself, you should pay careful attention to it because he's trying to tell you something. Again, don't do this. Again, I'm going to run it back again. Don't do this. I'm going to run it back one more time. Don't do this. He's running it back because he knows man. Man quickly forgets what God said. That's why I'm going to run it back one more time. Even like our parents tell us to do something. They tell us to do this. Like, hey, I'm, I'm one, of, one of them people too. Parents tell me to go do something. You know, a couple hours later, like, didn't I tell you to do this? Oh, yeah, my bad. I forgot about it. We forget. And it's the same with God. That's what God reiterates things over and over again. Don't forget what I said. So let's go back down to verse 14. We're almost done. We only got a couple more verses left. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as, is, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Now Jehovah Jireh means God my provider or God will provide. No matter what God asks us to sacrifice, whatever it is cannot compare to what God will replace it with. Now can someone read, uh, we're almost done, we got like three more verses. Can someone read verse 15 and 16? And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. Know it again. The Lord acknowledges Isaac as his only son because Isaac represented the promise, which was the bloodline that Jesus would come to to deliver his people from bondage and captivity. Verse 17, it says, That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heavens, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. Thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. 
God wanted to make sure that Abraham's allegiance was to the Lord and not to multiple gods like his father. That's why he said, I want you to leave the land where your father is. I want you to leave out from the people that you're used to hanging out with. I want you to leave out from the people who you're used to calling and doing these things. I want you to leave out from them because what I'm trying to do in your life, it's going to separate you from people. It's going to bump up heads against the people who you're used to being with. I need to test your faith to see if you're really going to trust me and believe me in the things that I'm calling you to do. Because of his obedience, in verse 17, God said that he would multiply his seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand of the sea, and they will be blessed because he was willing to stretch out his faith a little further and obey. Not only that, when we obey God, he allows us to possess the gate of our enemies. He allows us to possess the gate of our enemies. Now, what, what does the gate represent? The gate or the... The gate represents captivity. It represents bondage, despair, depression, loss of confidence. It represents jail, a place where people can't get out of. When you're locked behind a gate, you're in a place of no escape, which we all were in until Jesus came and unlocked the door and set us all free. He walked down our street and took captivity captive and freed us all from bondage. Now, because of Abraham's obedience, not notice that as a result, his seed will possess the gate of his enemies. You may never know what is in store for you. Those around you are those to come when God asks you to do something or stretch out your faith and move without doubt. You may be the very one who God uses to bless somebody else or to speak a word that brings forth deliverance to somebody else. He said, I've given them power to possess the gate of their enemies. He told Peter, and in the book of Matthew, he said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Why won't the gates prevail? Because I've given you power to possess the gates of your enemies. I've given you power to possess that gate. So it's not going to prevail against you because I've given you the power to possess it. So you're going to shut the door when the devil comes in like a flood to capture your family or friends or whoever. I've given you power to come in and to shut the gate or the door. I've given you power when you come into your job and there's certain people that I just happen to allow you to be around. I've given you power to possess that gate because they're in bondage but you have power to possess that gate that the devil has them in bondage in. I want you to go in there and open up the door and let them out and when them devils are coming after you I want you to shut the gate because you have power from on high. You have been given authority from heaven and that authority super exceeds the authority of the enemy. You may very well deliver everyone in your family, your workplace, your school, the prostitutes on the corner, the babies dying in hospitals by simply obeying God. By simply just doing what he says do. You may be the deliverer that he's been waiting for. I've been waiting for you for the longest to get it together. I've been waiting for you the longest to stretch out your faith and do what I've asked you to do. I didn't just save you and nobody else in the family just to save. There was something in you that I particularly saw that can be used to deliver everybody else in your family, Joseph. You'll be the one that delivers them from the famine and the things that are to come. They don't know what's coming, but I've gifted you with talents and abilities. Man can't perceive or understand God, so moving by faith like this would be foolishness. But to us, it is the power of God. God has a way of flipping the script and making your enemies your footstool. But it takes sacrifice, obedience, and being attentive to the voice of God. And notice here from Genesis 12, this is profound. I had to put this in there. From Genesis 12 to Genesis uh, chapter, 20, uh, chapter 22, Abraham went through 10 completed cycles of the testing of his faith. 10 completed cycles of the testing of his faith before God blessed him. 10, 10, 10. 10. And after those 10, he got the blessing. After 10. Because God is looking, okay, I'm going to test you here. Okay. Now I'm going to test you here. Okay. Now I'm going to test you here. I'm going to test you here. I'm going to test you here. Here, here, here. 10. Okay. Ten. All right. Bless him. I'm about to multiply. I'm going to double it, triple it. Because I'm stretching you. Okay. The here, it might have been one or two. Okay. Here's your blessing. Okay. This time, four, five. He's always stretching. It may be 15 that you go through. But the greater reward, you don't know what the reward is. Somebody may come up and bless you with a Benz. Somebody may bless you with a house. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody may bless you with whatever. But God may bless you with an anointing to go in the hospital and walk past somebody's room who's dying. The doctor didn't just say that this person's life is over. There was a story I got to tell you. This last story. This is it. I got no more stories from y'all. But this is a last story. I can't remember if it was Miami or if it was Wright State University. But there was a young man who just had faith to believe God. 
I think it was either his grandfather or father. I don't even think Kevin remembers the story, but I remember this is so profound. Um, his father or grandfather had had some type of stroke or seizure to where it, it caused um, some type of aneurysm to where he was thrown into a coma. And now the doctors who do all their studies and all this type of stuff said um, it was a 98% chance that he was going to die. So he, he told the family, you need to start making funeral arrangements now. You need to start getting everybody together. You need to start doing all this stuff now. You need to just start doing it now. And everybody was like, man, it's crying. Everybody's, you know, get thinking about, okay, oh, well, you know, plan, okay, how many people we're going to contact when we send this up. And, no, and the person was like, no, man, we're going to believe God. I don't care if it's a 2% chance that they, they, go, they can make it. It doesn't matter. And the person, I believe it was right there, I can't remember. I might have to call Kathy Dees and ask her. But they started sending a text out, and they was telling people, just pray, just pray, just pray, just pray, and see what God does. And because he had the faith to believe God, he trusted God. Do you know that his grandfather or father woke up out that coma? He woke up out that coma. No doctors didn't know what to say. It was like, well, you know, um, uh, we, we, you know, what happened is the blood goes. No, they didn't want to give God the glory. They didn't want to give God the praise. But he had enough faith to believe God, even though it was a two percent chance. Do you realize that God? All God says is. All you need is a mustard seed of faith. That's all he needed. All he needed was 2%. That's all he needed was just 2% just to show you that he's God, that he's the one that sits on the circle there and all power is in his hands, that he can turn something around in an instant if you have a mustard seed, if you're willing to stretch out your faith. And that young man was crazy enough to say, you know what? What do I got to lose and believe in God? You know, they say there's a 98% chance he's going to die. There's a 2% chance he's going to live. I'm going to run with the 2%. Everybody else is running with the 98 But I'm going to stretch out and believe God. I'm going to send it to everybody else. So I want y'all to pray. We're going to believe God for this. We're going to believe that God can deliver. And God woke that man up out that call. We talk about giving God some glory. We talk about stretching out your faith. That's what God calls for. He wants us to stretch out our faith daily. Amen? And that's all I got. Amen.